Hi everyone, welcome and welcome back to Dr. Han's classroom. So this past week, the FDA Advisory Committee on Vaccines has been very busy discussing and voting on Moderna and Johnson and Johnson COVID vaccine booster dose EUA applications. Now by now, a lot of you have probably heard the news that the committee member unanimously voted to recommend the booster dose. So this week, let's look at some of the safety reasons and possible implications behind the recommendations. So without further ado, let's get started. So here I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes versions of the two-day meetings. The two-day meetings recording were about 14 hours. I'm sure none of us have this much time to go over the videos. So I'm going to present everything in 15 minutes, okay? Let's first take a look at the voting result. Now first, for Moderna COVID booster dose, all 19 members of the advisory committee voted to recommend the Moderna booster for three specific groups of people, which exactly mirrors the Pfizer booster dose recommendations. The first one would be 65 plus years old, 18 to 64 years old with high risk of severe COVID-19, and the third group is 18 to 64 years Years old with high exposure risk to COVID-19. And as for the Johnson & Johnson or Janssen COVID-19 booster dose, the committee also voted uh, to recommend the Johnson & Johnson booster dose, but the recommendation covers a much wider population. They recommend anyone who are 18 years old or above with at least two months after the single primary vaccine to get the booster. Now that we know the voting result, let's look back what was Moderna's argument for the need of the booster vaccine. Moderna basically mirrored most of their arguments like what Pfizer did in September. They first claimed that people who more recently got the vaccine had about 36% lower rate of breakthrough infections compared to those who got the vaccine much earlier. Notice the breakthrough differences in 65 and above was not as much, only at about 17.4%. This data was collected from July to August when the Delta variant was dominant in cases in the U.S. So in a simple word, they meant that the protection drop is because of waning over time and it's not necessarily all related to the Delta variant. Now, in an ideal world, the company should present sufficient data to argue the effectiveness of a booster. But last month, we had already seen how little data Pfizer presented with only 306 participants in their booster dose trial. Now warning, some of you may get mad, but please don't kill or don't shoot the messenger. And here we are, Moderna presented data with only 149 participants in their booster study. 112 of them were between 18 to 64 and 37 were 65 and above. Yes, this is an extremely small amount of data and particularly from a company asking for a booster dose authorization. The Moderna claimed that the 50 microgram dose of mRNA vaccine would be enough, which is half of the original dose. It was very effective in restoring antibody levels. The booster has a 13-fold increase in against the original virus and even higher 17-fold increase in against the Delta variant. Now, this is also the argument for not having the need to make a Delta-specific booster vaccine. Although every member voted yes to recommend the Moderna booster dose, some member, for example, Dr. Moore, did voice out saying that, well, I've got some real issue with this vote, more of, it of a gut feeling rather than really truly serious data. I think it is very important that companies really take seriously that we need to see good solid data and it will need to be explained well. So they did voice the concern of the small amount of data presented by the company. Then the question comes to why it was the lower dose, why it was the half dose. 
Moderna gave three arguments. First, it was enough to generate a robust response, even with 50 micrograms of mRNA vaccine. And second, lower dose has fewer immediate side effects such as fever and muscle pains. And third, and by dividing the dose into half, it will allow a better supply on a global scale. And suddenly, they are very conscious about global supply of their vaccine. But here is the problem, is that no one knows how long that half dose booster will last, and it is based on too many assumptions instead of solid data. And second, the immunocompromised people are already getting the 100 micrograms third dose. What should they do now? Well, the CDC ACIP will have some explanations to do during their meeting next week. Now the safety. Now clearly, with that small sample size, Moderna cannot provide data on rare side effects such as myocarditis. This piece of data again was based on the Israel data. Now it is important to know that they only use the Pfizer vaccine, although it is still a similar mRNA vaccine, but they are different. First, the mRNA amount is different, and clinically, we have already seen a slightly different response in people. Israel so far has given booster Pfizer vaccine or booster dose to about 3.7 million of their people. Interestingly, they have seen less myocarditis risk than the original series. They only reported 17 cases of myocarditis and pericarditis, and all of the cases were in males, and they were more common in males less than 30 years old. And lastly, we all know that the committee voted based on very little direct efficacy or effectiveness data and indirect safety data. Now, I'm not sure how this can help the public to gain confidence in the booster dose. Now, let's move on to the J&J argument. The J&J took a very different approach to argue for their booster dose. Instead of claiming waning immunity, they claimed that because the first dose was only about 50 to 70 percent effectiveness, depending on the result from different countries, there is room for improvement with the second dose. The company presented data on antibodies durability, which was also recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine. I have all the links down in the description box. Now, J&J showed that their vaccine-induced antibody levels virtually did not drop that much after eight months compared to Pfizer and Moderna vaccine-induced antibodies, which dropped from anywhere between 34 to 44 fold in the same period. But please Please do notice that there were only eight samples in the Johnson & Johnson column in this data. So this is again a very small sample size. This argument was not well received. The FDA did reference a study recently also published in the New England Journal of Medicine that showed the real-world efficacy of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And basically, that study concluded that the Johnson & Johnson COVID vaccine was much lower effective than the mRNA vaccines in terms of protection against infection leading to hospitalizations and also ICU emissions. But J&J did give the committee the clinical trial data based on more than 9,000 people, which is quite different when we looking at the Pfizer data and the Moderna data. And this is one of the graph in their presenting document. Again, these links are all in the description box below. Now, this graph did show that the booster dose significantly increased the protection against all variants of concern, including the lambda, delta, gamma, and beta. But then the next argument came up with the timing of the second dose. So J&J did a separate small study and showed that the booster dose given at six months provided a much greater antibody level boost than the two months regimen. 
Now, other than the boosting of antibody levels, JNJ also advocated for six months post primary dose because of two reasons. First, two months getting a second dose almost look like a two dose series instead of a booster dose, and that would really hurt or potentially affect the marketing advantage they currently have to have market as a single dose COVID-19 vaccine. And in terms of the safety, JNJ gave us an update of rare but serious side effects after the authorization of their first dose. They noted 133 cases of thrombosis with thrombocytopenia in the U.S., and only 73 cases met the criteria for investigation based on CDC uh, criteria, and that would translate to about 2.1 cases of blood clots per million doses. Now, very sadly, 12 people died. Overall, the company presented a table saying that the booster dose did not significantly increase the risk of all the reported rare side effects. Now, which J and J call these rare adverse effect, adverse events of interest. Notice that between the, the uh, primary dose, which is on the left hand side column, and the booster dose, those numbers were quite similar. And the committee ultimately voted to recommend the J and J second dose for every adult, and at least two months after the single dose primary vaccination. The advisory committee wrapped up the two-day meeting with a discussion on mixing vaccines. Now it was only a discussion, and it is not a vote. And here is the preprint of the result looking at mixing different COVID-19 vaccine as a booster. Again, I have all the links in the description box down below. So what you're looking at here is a uh, chart that I adopted using data presented in the article. Now this preprint study showed that mixing in mRNA vaccine after Johnson and Johnson vaccine had the highest amount of antibody boost between 30 to 75 fold increases. Now it was strange that mixing in Johnson and Johnson after mRNA vaccine did not increase antibody levels that much and there, we don't know why. Now again, this was a quite small study with only 458 volunteers. It was hard to know the exact impact of mixing in a vaccine or if the higher neutralization antibodies correlate with protection. The last time I did reference a study showing too many neutralization antibodies it could be harmful in some cases. JNJ did mention there are questions that remain about how safe mixing boosting dose would be and how durable the response would be uh, in the long term. Now, they clearly does not want to mix booster vaccine. Perhaps there may be a potential conflict of interest. Now, that was all the discussion, but what about the implications and the overall impression of the two-day meetings? So if you watch the meetings live during Thursday and Friday, or if you have time to go back to watch the recording, it was pretty clear that both Moderna and Johnson & Johnson went to the meeting with an expectation of the advisory committee voting in favor of the UA application. The data was lackluster. Now because Pfizer got their booster dose authorized, it would be unreasonable to deny people who had the Moderna and Johnson & Johnson vaccine to receive their respective booster dose. Now, at least the recommendation would allow people who need and want the booster dose uh, not having the need to mix in the booster uh, dose. They can get their respective one. Some committee member wanted to emphasize that these votes would give people an option to receive the booster dose, but it is unclear how this message would impact policymakers' decision at both the government and organizational level. Now, would booster dose become an option or eventually be a mandate? It really depends on where you live or who you work for. Now, another implication that very few people talked about is the potential error in giving the Moderna booster shot. 
Notice that the Moderna booster dose is half of the original vaccine, and if you are getting it at a pharmacy, you need to make it clear to the pharmacist that this is the booster dose that I'm getting and not the original one. Now, usually that would not be an issue at the pharmacy. They have protocols to prevent medication errors, but right now many pharmacies are understaffed. Although vaccination errors are very rare, we had seen at least one recent report of young children were mistakenly given adult doses of the COVID vaccine when they only went for flu vaccines. The pharmacy do need to make sure when booster half dose is given and that is not the flu dose. Now, I suppose going to the pharmacy at a slowest time may be better. So I know some of you are probably very frustrated or even angry by now because those decisions are based on data with a very small sample size.、Uh, that makes very little sense. I know that, and I'm frustrated too. Now, some weeks ago, some of you asked me if I would consider getting the booster dose, and let's talk about it briefly. So I received my second dose of the Moderna mRNA vaccine at the end or near the end of April. So time-wise, I am almost eligible. So it's about six months now. Now, but. Obviously, I'm not 65 years old, and I am not at a particular risk or high risk for severe COVID-19. Now, in terms of my job, I do see people, and I do see the same group of students pretty much every day. So, am I at a high risk of exposure? I'm not exactly sure at this point. On the other hand, if the University or my employer decided that everyone need to get the booster dose. That would certainly put me in a very difficult position, and I cannot afford losing my full time job at this point. Now that's me personally, and I understand everyone in a different situation, and I respect everyone's personal choice. And if you have one, now it's getting more difficult these days. I completely understand. And now that the booster dose discussion is pretty much done, the next big one would be the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine use in children five to eleven years old. Now this one is going to be a huge discussion. I'm pretty sure that, and it will happen on October 26. Now, if you would like to continue follow COVID-19 update and other related topics with me, please consider liking this video, comment below, and also consider subscribing to the. Channel. This channel need your help to reach more people. Now, so that's all for me this week, and、uh, thank you very much for watching. And I'll see you in my next video. Meanwhile, please stay safe and healthy. Bye.